So I was saying uh, for this week's uh, readings, we have, as you know, the third part of the, of the manuscripts, 1844 manuscripts by Marx. And then we have a section by Engels, he wrote uh, later. Uh, and then he, there he focused on, on Hegel mm, and uh, some ideas that we have already talked about. But for the manuscripts, uh, as you know, Marx also in the last section of, of that section, he goes back to, to, uh, to uh, a critique of Hegel. Um, we haven't read Hegel for this course, but we've tried to make reference as, as much as possible. This time, it might be uh, uh, the other way around, uh, uh, namely, we will not in, go into uh, depth of the, the, the Hegelian kind of uh, uh, part of the issue, like, for example, you know, the phenomenology, uh, the ontology and whatnot. Uh, but, but Hegel's phenomenology, for sure, Hegel's logic, those parts we have to kind of um, pass over quickly because there's already a lot and there are especially a uh, few uh, very important concepts by Marx we need to uh, visit and revisit uh, as we start reading uh, Capital, right? Again, this is, uh, remember, 1844, so four years before the big event, uh, that is 1848, uh, revolution and four years after, you know, the Hegelians, you know, kind of uh, lost ground in terms of their uh, privilege in universities. Uh, but about, you know, a, a decade from uh, the time when Hegel is basically uh, talked about everywhere in intellectual and academic circles, uh, or relevant ones at least. Uh, and here, as you can see, Marx again uh, is going uh, back to a critique of left Hegelians. Uh, here you see uh, a lot of positive notes about uh, Feuerbach, right? And, and later Engel says uh, that uh, at some point they were all Feuerbachians. But he... he, he uh, it gives uh, those notes in the context of, again, criticizing the other left Hegelians uh, and the problems with the other left Hegelians. So, as you know, the section starts with, uh, with uh, private property. Um, so a critique of the previous conceptualizations, uh, theories, uh, in political economy by other communists, socialists, uh, and even to some degree, of course, left Hegelians, but mainly Hegel himself. And uh, where it becomes very relevant to Hegel is, again, the, 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 the role of the concept of labor. As you know, Marx says, uh, now, Hegel realized the, the central role of uh, labor, but only focused on the positive side of that role, not the negative side. And it's true, uh, Hegel does talk about both, actually, you know, of course, private property, that it is essential for, for uh, the human personality, for the human identity, that it here being private property. And labor is, of course, it's through labor that we give our lives uh, meaning, we as human beings. So I'm, um, I'm oversimplifying because we have to go over some of these uh, the basic uh, uh, background issues. So Hegel, again, Hegel says private property is, is essential for the human personality. Uh, the labor is again uh, the, uh, the essential, the human activity 
uh, through which we live our lives uh, being. Okay, now that is that is positive, extremely positive. Marx says, not precisely here, but I will come to uh, to the manuscripts in a minute. Here, what he uh, before uh, this point or in other places rather, he says, okay, that uh, that uh, I grant you that that premise that yes, uh, private property is essential for the human uh, personality. Now, what Hegel didn't talk about, so Marx points to this problem, that those who, uh, who create all the, all the property, all private property, in this case we're talking about uh, 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 the capitalist modes of production, those who create that actually don't have any, and because, and that's the proletariat, uh, proletariat because uh, doesn't have, let's just use it as a singular, doesn't have property, then what's happening, then it is deprived of, let's say, personhood or personality. Now, there is a problem, therefore, in this kind of mode of production, in this, in the existing order, right? So the, the eventually Marx reached the conclusion that the, the proletariat is in a way forced to abolish this system, to abolish class society for good, forever. Uh, and uh, through doing that, it abolishes itself as a class, right? As, a, uh, as an, an identity-less class, if you will, right? So the, the, the problem is the, the existence of the proletariat itself. Uh, and, and of course, it's you know it's a very long story. Then, if we talk about the the transition from this point right to this argument to the argument of the dictatorship of the proletariat. By the way, Marx took both terms, both the proletariat and dictatorship, uh, from uh, Roman history. So it is not dictatorship means completely different thing. Uh, but also keep in mind, simply it means, you know, d during uh, exceptional or, or cases, situations when there are crises, wars, and so on, uh, so you have a dictatorship, uh, like a group, for example, of generals uh, deciding uh, or making important decisions to, again, this extreme oversimplification. Uh, but also keep in mind the proletariat being the majority, so dictatorship of the proletariat is automatically the most democratic system you could possibly have prior to communism. And because Marx and Engels believed that you can't leap into, like jump into communism or the communist modes of production right away uh, from uh, capitalism, Therefore, you have that, that uh, transition, that revolutionary period. Right? So, uh, but of course, you know, those who uh, tried forever to criminalize Marx, they're very, very quick to, you know, attack that point. Oh, dictatorship of the proletariat. Oh, look what Stalin did. It, it, is, it is simply irrelevant. I could, of course, we can criticize, we should criticize everything, including Marx and Engels. That's, that we don't even need to emphasize that anymore. But uh, it, uh, you know, stupid uh, attacks are still stupid, you know, because at least, you know, we should first see what Marx said, what Marx wrote before we attack this, because it's, a, again, it's a different concept, different uh, uh, meaning or for the word dictatorship also when you join it with proletariat dictatorship of the proletariat it, it simply it is a, in, in Marx's system it is a democratic again it is the most uh, democratic uh, system you could have theoretically of course theoretically everything is theoretically uh, but theoretically again Marx is not just saying this theoretically, like 
out of the clouds. Actually, that is exactly his critique of other uh, philosophers, including Hegel and the left Hegelians. In what sense? In the sense of, so, uh, so I'm going to focus on two things, again, private property, but also in the sense of, and this is the word now, abstraction. So abstraction, to Marx, is a fallacy. There is no way around it, right? But you would say, what do you mean, abstraction? Well, Marx is theorizing and conceptualizing. Doesn't he abstract? That's the trick. That is why uh, uh, critique and praxis meet in Marx, or that's how Marx sees them. So what do we mean? Now let's let's uh, talk a little bit about abstraction. We'll go back to private property. We'll come back again to abstraction uh, in the in the context of critique of Hegel. So with private property, what happens is that uh, uh, economists, Marx says, uh, look around. Uh, you know, philosophers uh, look around and 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 whatever they perceive in the world, so I'm, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, they take as, so they abstract it and they take it as almost like natural laws or the laws of society, human nature, and so on, laws of human nature, and so on, so on. Now, there are several problems with this procedure, uh, which is, again, a procedure, say, for example, uh, Adam Smith or Mill and others, uh, and, and the liberals. Uh, uh, for now, what uh, what or what are the problems? One is the obvious uh, problem of of uh, uh, denying history. Right? Uh, so as long as you take history as a premise, then that's a fallacy. That procedure, right? One, two. These philosophers themselves operate within a society in which division of labor according to capitalist modes of production are normalized, internalized, naturalized, and, you know, all that say, taken for granted. But, so in this problem, then, there's another problem. What do they do in that world of division of labor? Of course, Marx says the only labor Hegel knew was what? Mental, intellectual. Now that will, of course, have consequences in the theory, not just the main fallacy, right? But also the fallacy of the role, like the problems that, uh, uh, that are, are created because of that, you know, that kind of, let's say, subjective position. So it, it, there's a compound problem here, right? In today's world, we would simply say, uh, you know, your class position or your gender position, whatever privileges you, you, you have from that position, you look at the world and you see it in a certain way that you can't be objective and impartial and so on. And you already can see the, the significance of Marx for postmodernism, post-structuralism, and so on, for critique as such, for critical theory as such, right? So, to Marx, then, the, the beginning of the problem is, again, we go back, let's say, to private property. Private property has, uh, has been, again, uh, eternalized. Private, private property uh, has... Uh, is given uh, a status of kind of uh, almost like a, a law of nature, you know, part of the human nature and all that. Uh, and and it, it's turned into part of the very being of the human being, the conception of like being a human, right? But also through that, of course, it's now private property is almost transcendental. So that is like almost like uh, you could say theologization of private 
for all right uh, so that that is a very very serious uh, problem then with that and uh, to Marx of course uh, one thing these people uh, forgot to, uh, a very important issue if at the heart of private property the essence of private property is labor why didn't they talk about that essential role of labor right and if we do talk about that essential role of labor then Marx says we, okay we reach a problem the labor the, the more the laborer works the more alienated she becomes so you see there's already a contradiction yes you have private property so central uh, in, in, the, in the capitalism but also because of that because of that central role it actually increases endlessly uh, indefinitely it increases human alienation right so then you have a problem this is this cannot go on forever it's not about being a marxist or not being a marxist you can tell this you read later in, 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 in angles remember when he goes back to uh, hegel's rational and real every all real is rational rational is real so angle says okay yeah but don't use it in a conservative way to say whatever exists is there because it's rational because there's a reason he says it is important to to think dialectically what is real is not simply what exists it is what is necessary right historically and then he takes it like he, he turns those same uh, dialectics to a revolutionary place but we'll leave that for now aside it's just uh, uh, stay with marx um, um, private property now Marx, you know, jumps ahead, it, it makes a huge leap to make the a very important statement, but could be very confusing. It says, uh, communism alone is sufficient for uh, negating private property. And by that, of course, he means really negating uh, 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 the whole, transforming the whole of society, capitalist society. But negating cap negating private property is is by no means just that simple you know kind of redistribution of wealth then we are done right because you could be you could be uh, religious and just do that you know why then yeah you're a socialist you're fine what is what is Marx's problem with that then? And Marx not is he's not even he's actually very critical of that kind of oversimplification or moralization of of, uh, of equality of questions of uh, equality but also the question of private property it is more than that in what sense so i'm going to here uh, jump to the second section uh, this, uh, of the third part of the manuscripts if i were to uh, summarize the a central argument there uh, i would say for marx is communism is the negation of private property but we have again we have to be careful what this means because private property you have to think about it already as uh, as a, a case of negation you know the the, the human uh, identity uh, as such uh, you know the worker has has been uh, alienated has been negated and uh, and private property is that stated therefore communism comes along as uh, as a negation of that other negation which is also a negation of another case now marx is not under the illusion this is very important not to commit uh, a very uh, common mistake to assume that the negation of the negation is going back to moment or to to uh, uh, to the first term, the first moment. That is not dialectical. So the negation of negation is already, uh, it, it preserves what is in the first moment, 
and what of course transcends and change you know uh, uh, the, 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 the that moment to another to a higher level so when Marx and Engels talk about progress uh, that's what they mean and in that sense yes of course Engels is right as you read for today um, uh, for today's class Engels says uh, history is simply endless movement of progress but it's that doesn't mean it's linear it's one line and then this is something we cannot deny so the every state every historical state is uh, is a state of changing to another uh, another uh, state historical state and again that he ties that back to the rational and the real okay so again communism is the negation of private property and in that sense, then, I'll finish that line of thought there. It is the end of alienation. At this stage in Marx's thought, he still focused on, on this idea of alienation. Uh, but it's not completely, uh, uh, you know, formulated theoretically that we have to wait until the rights capital. But Communism is the end of alienation in that uh, uh, personal, individual, but also, which is at the same time, universal sense. Okay, so uh, I read just a quote here, one line. Marx says, the society is the complete unity of man with nature, the true resurrection of nature consistent naturalism of man and the consistent consistent humanism of nature. So there is this division when when you think in terms of abstraction, you look at the world, you see the human being, you see nature, you see whatever God and so on and so forth. Now this the, this is a problem in two senses. This is a problem one in the sense that these things actually don't don't exist. In separation, so that's just a fallacy. Remember, that's abstraction. But when they do also, and they do in a sense, like in the sense of alienation, we are alienated from nature, even though there's it doesn't make any sense. We cannot exist outside nature, and there is no such thing as nature uh, without without the human, and there is no such thing as human without nature. But that alienation is there, and that is going to the, the only way for that to be solved is actually to obviously to negate that alienation going forward. Very important, not going backward. Not this is again not Jan Jacques Rousseau. This is Marx. So this is again going forward, uh, and and the only way to do that is to negate private property. Now that is communism. What else is communism? We don't know. We we have to start the revolution. Then then we will start to to know that smart position. Okay. So the, now you get the idea. So the, the the very quickly again, private property and its negation in terms of the what we can say negatively only uh, about uh, communism. So here then the, that, that kind of mode of production that is communism, it is, uh, it, it is the point at which uh, you know the, the estrangement, that estrangement we've been talking about comes to an end in that other hist history of human, the real history of, of, uh, of human being, you know, should start before that. What we have, all these other issues are expressions of the, uh, the human uh, alienation. So uh, whether uh, through religion, family, state, law, morality, science, art, and this is exactly the, in the order Marx mentions them, he says, uh, only particular modes of uh, production 
and fall under its general law, right? What general law? The modes of production. So all these things, religion, family, state law, you can, you can, you know, we, you can be the atheist like Fjordbach, that's great, we'll be good friends, you attack religion, you should, and all that, but if you forget that the, these are only particular modes of production under its general law, then you are missing the point. The same goes for the law, for state, for morality. We can talk forever about how, how uh, you know, those bastards, those billionaires are, you know, uh, doing so much evil in the world and so on. You are just missing the point. That's that's really not the point. It is, in nobody, I mean, uh, we couldn't say it's a bad thing, but it is, it is, it is misleading. You know, it is again a kind of a form of abstraction, if you will, if if we, if we use the, the term abstraction a little more liberally in this case. So the positive transcendence of private property, Marx says as the appropriation of human life is therefore the positive transcendence of all estrangement. That's to say, the return of man from religion, family, state, etc. to his human, i.e. social existence. Aha, social existence. And this is where we need to pose again. I know today's lecture will be a little longer than usual, uh, but it's just because of the amount of uh, readings. Please feel free to uh, to stop me, write a question, or just speak up, however you like. But let's pose on this idea of the social. So the human is back to the social as uh, social. Now, remember, Marx does something else here. Marx also refutes that. A false dichotomy of the individual versus society. Who created that that dichotomy? We know, you know. The entire like history of philosophy, at least modern philosophy, takes that for granted always, no? And literature and so on, no? And, but an obvious example is what? Yeah. If you want to speak, of course, if you don't. So an obvious example of that, that uh, dichotomy, the individual versus society, uh, which is, to Marx is wrong. You can't have that dichotomy. And I'm just going to explain quickly why. So Adam Smith, remember, because the whole idea is, you know, uh, the thesis uh, Adam Smith introduces and becomes so, uh, uh, you know, well-known, famous, celebrated, and so on, is that, you know, through our own, uh, because we are naturally e egoistic and through our being selfish, through simply being selfish, Within that framework of the free market, we end up actually serving the society unintentionally. And he, he emphasized that. It's not intentional. It's not that I just do my job and, you know, I collect money, uh, but also I know that is good for the society. No, no, he says it is done selfishly, but that is going to, the consequence of that is going to be the best for society. So we are selfish, and that selfishness, Adam Smith said, there's an arrangement. You could actually have that selfishness be in the service of society. So you have these oppositions actually kind of coming into a harmony and a free market and capitalism. Marx, being, being Marx, being such a uh, critical philosopher, he goes back to the premise. There's a problem with that premise. It is false to assume you have the individual, then you have society, this, this contradiction. And of course, then you have neoliberals, they go even further. They say there is no society, there's just the individual. Factual, right? Of course. 
But to Marx, it's the other way around. And again, this is not a moral statement. But to Marx, the human being is inherently always, inevitably, a social being. Social, the human is a social human. Alienated under capitalism, but still all we do is social. Can only be defined, understood, analyzed uh, in terms of that social character or the, or the human. And, and when that is made, when that expression is made difficult or impossible, then you have a case of alienation. It doesn't mean that the social is something separate from the human. How? Uh, you would say, I'm just a poet. I don't care about people. I just write my poetry. I don't care about people. That is utterly, allow me to say, stupid as a claim. Why? Because when I write poetry, I, I use language, right? In a written, for example. The language is a social institution. You can't. Okay, I just think about things just for myself, just fantasy, daydream, and so on. You are still doing something social. It, there is no way out of this. Whatever it is, like you are in a lab, you uh, you write a, a novel about uh, about whatever isolation, being alone, rebel, whatever. You are still extremely social. In fact, most of those cases are protests against this very alienation Marx is talking about, right? So this, the, the existentialists uh, pride about the individual, the, the lonely individual and so on, and all the dark literature. I read it as actually a protest, just like Marx did, a protest against that alienation, except Marx puts it in the bigger picture. He says, Ah, it's so easy for you just to deny the world and say, I only exist. Right? In a way, that's what you were doing. But to Marx, uh, being a human, of course, in, entails suffering. In the sense of, remember, he says, my existence, my identity is dependent on the Side, inherently, necessarily, historically, naturally, ontologically. I get hungry, I need food, it's out there, I have to see. So my dependent is, my existence is dependent on that object outside, on the external. Uh, and by being an object of that other, of that outside, I actually confirm my, my being my, as a human. Because again, the human is social. In fact, he goes much further to argue a thing that exists only for itself, a thing that is not an object for another object outside itself, cannot be natural, cannot be objective, actually simply cannot exist. Right? And there, you know, instead, right there, you, you, you actually, this, this uh, uh, proposition, you already see Marx's atheism is much more radical than Feuerbach's. Because if you take it, if you apply this, this, uh, this argument to the case of God, he basically, is to, uh, the conclusion is that God cannot exist. Because if God is that autonomous being, right, just exists for itself, it doesn't make sense. It cannot exist. Uh, okay, so he's again here in this case, uh, uh, communism is kind of the, uh, you know, reconciliation, making peace between uh, the, the, the social and the human as a social being. Now, of course, the human always stayed social, but when alienated, then what do you have? You have a case of crisis. The pro proletariat is a state of crisis. 
That's why it's not sustainable. That's why the proletariat is going to uh, make the revolution. Maybe not now, but what will happen now if it doesn't make the revolution? There will be there will be crises. There will be crises after crises. There will be wars. There will be fascism. There will be barbarism. That's exactly what uh, uh, what Rosa Luxemburg talked about, right? Nineteen nineteen, when she said, "If the pro- proletariat doesn't make the uh, socialist revolution, uh, it's a crossroad. We will end up in barbarism." And who could really argue she was? Wrong. Remember, that's exactly the time when fascism rise to power right? in, in several places in Europe already, but very obviously, you know what I'm talking about, in Italy and, and, and elsewhere. You know, we, I mean, that is, that's a different issue. I can't go there, we don't have time. But elsewhere as well, there are some good, good books about, for example, uh, the beginnings of fascism. It's not called fascism, but but the connection is very clear. Uh, okay, uh, and in this case, I'm talking about Kamalism, of course, and the influence of Kamalism on both Mussolini and Hitler. But let's leave that aside because that will open a whole door of other other debates uh, about you know the history of fascism. But the point is. The, the existence of, of the proletariat is a proof, is a living proof of a problem, a, a, a problem of, of rationality. Now, if the, it is irrational, then it cannot be real. It cannot be sustainable, even if you are a Hegelian, remember? Because the real is rational. And the proletariat, the existence of the proletariat means... The, the society, the order, the, the dominant uh, uh, order is uh, irrational, cannot be sustained historically. It's going to, it must change, it must uh, collapse, it, something else must happen. But for that, that is not automatic. For that to happen, we need the rational factor. We need the human will, we need the revolutionary uh, element to make the leap forward as opposed to, you know, falling back into barbarism. And it seems that we keep falling back into barbarism. That's exactly what happens in, uh, in for, uh, 1848, four years after the Spanish. Right? That's what happens in, in 1940, really before that. Uh, but definitely 1914, several places in Europe and the peripheries of Europe, uh, uh, and then in the in-between wars, and then, of course, uh, the 30s, 36, uh, all the way to 39, then 39 to 45, then 45, uh, all the way to, say, if we divide it that way, until the end of the 1980s, and most certainly after the 1980s, when people like Fukuyama uh, declare this is the end of history, we reach that point of, of a perfect ideological evolution. We cannot find anything better than uh, uh, liberal democracy, by which he really meant uh, capitalist liberalism. And that was supposed to be the end of history, and we can, you, you can uh, test the, the, uh, the validity of that argument yourself, uh, we keep falling back into barbarism, we are back in barbarism, you, you can just take a look really, west, east, south, north, you, you, you can even in terms of the rise of fascism, you can point to, uh, uh, to, this, uh, to this issue, you know, how it is embodied again and again. Okay. Uh, there is more about the social being and the object of the of the social being and so on, but I will not go more into that. Few quick notes in terms of uh, bringing all this back to abstraction and critique of Hegel. Uh, 
unless you want a, a break, if, unless someone stops me, I'll just go on. Uh, and then after I'm done, maybe we will take a break. Yeah? Any questions so far? You can write if you want. Any questions? No? Okay, I'll go on. Uh, okay. Now, uh, another quote very quickly here. Thinking and being are thus certainly distinct, but at the same time, this again, the second part of the, of the third section of the manuscript, and the 1844 manuscript, thinking and being are thus certainly distinct, but at the same time, they are in unity with each other. Now, the reason I chose this short, simple, in a way, simple, uh, statement, and I'm going to just post it here in the chat room for you. Uh, the reason is that here we can, in simple words, in one proposition, you can already uh, detect the Marxist criticism of, of Hegel. So with Hegel, the problem is, if we put it in, again, very simply, very uh, briefly, the problem is, again, abstraction in the form, in what sense? In the sense of claiming that he moves from estrangement. To solve the estrangement, he, 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 he creates more estrangement. This is the Hegelian line. Now, Marx is with him halfway. The other half, something must be done in order to, to fix the problem. Because for Hegel... Uh, Hegel starts with uh, with alienation. He ends up othering, abstracting, isolating, making irrelevant the subject, the object, the human being, and the, the, the human world and thinking and so on. Ending up in the only place you could end up if you if you make that essential uh, fallacy that is inherent in abstraction. And where does that, that other ending, that other bigger problem? Uh, uh, God, the absolute spirit. So then everything, so everything ends in the absolute uh, spirit. Remember, Marx kept saying, there's no just consciousness on its own. This consciousness all, always already belongs to a subject and it's of something. Uh, in, in the German ideology, he even says very, you know, very straightforward. Uh, he says nonsense like uh, self-awareness, self-consciousness. That it is just nonsense to talk about self-consciousness in that idealist sense. What is that idealist sense? First, you equate the human with the self, right? And then the, the self becomes just pure thinking, just consciousness itself. And then self-consciousness becomes almost consciousness just uh, pure eventually. So it is, it is disembodied. It is a consciousness without, without the world, without the body and, uh, and its world. So this is, in a way, the same problem he has with private property. Private property comes along, becomes so central and so on, and, and therefore capital and money become, take the place of God, literally, of all powerful. Within a history, it doesn't mean uh, two things Marx does. One, problematize it, you know, put it back in the con uh, historical context. Second, uh, you act accordingly, right? So you, you, you act with the consciousness, with the awareness of the, you know, this source of alienation, right? Because remember, he says, if, you, if I have money, then I don't need to, uh, to read, to go to... Uh, concerts and so on, because the money does all that, and vice versa, the worker, uh, 
uh, is encouraged to you know use more time to, for more labor instead of buying books, listening to music, doing theory, and so on and so forth. But eventually, all this in, in here necessarily private property is the source of uh, of alienation, not only for the worker, very important, not only for the worker, but also for the capitalist. Yeah. Uh, okay, so he has some great comments on, on, on this. He goes on, but uh, just one quick, if I know this is being very long, a very quick uh, quote here. Private property has made, again, I'm st still in the second section. Private property has made us so stupid and one sided that. An object is only ours when we have it, when it exists for us as capital, or when it is directly possessed, eaten, drunk, uh, worn, inhabited, etc. In short, when it is used by us. Although private property itself, again, conceives all these direct realizations of possession only as means of life and the life which they serve as means is the life of private property, labor, uh, uh, and conversion into capital. Okay. Why is this so important? Many reasons you can already tell, but labor, just again, the, the very last part, labor and conversion into capital. There is no private property, there is no capital without to put it you know quickly jump to the conclusion without exploitation of labor simply it, impossible it is important it is wrong it is impossible to think of a world in which capital can exist without exploitation of labor without what is exploitation of labor what is this term marx has a great note a uh, footnote I think it's number 30 or 31, yeah. where he, it is a footnote. He doesn't make the case in the other main text. It's a great footnote. It says, labor under capitalism is, it says, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm talking about prostitution. And no, no, all labor under capitalism is a form of prostitution. That's how we should understand it. So there is no, again, the, the main claim Keep in mind, there is no possibility of capital and therefore private property without exploitation of labor. What does it mean without exploitation of others? The only way for me to be rich, to have capital, is to make others work for me, basically. You know, uh, to, to, to make this possible. And, and the, the more they work, the less free they become. Why? Because the more capital I accumulate, and, and by definition, you know, I I will have more power over them, and they will uh, render themselves useless in this world of capital. Yeah. So, uh, you but you might say, okay, what about if I just go out there, or the capitalist goes out there, and just whatever makes. Finds a way, you know, in factory, whatever, without any workers, just make salt and water. This is not what you do, by the way. So, don't shout at me. So, this bottled water, how about that? Wow, okay, of course. That is the other main source. Uh, although it's still impossible to, to think about uh, the very possibility of all, all the chain, all the production, uh, which is always reproduction, also in commodities. And then the, the market and values, use values, use value, and so on. We'll come to that later. Exchange value, surplus value, and therefore capital without labor. So there's always labor, but if you want to, if it makes you feel better, then you can also talk about uh, the raw materials, extraction of raw materials. So the destruction of, of the very conditions of life, right? Or what we now called ecological. So capitalism is inherently built into 
uh, built all on the basis of these two forms of uh, uh, destruction or exploitation. Uh, to Marx, the way uh, then to reunite all this nature, the social, and the human, and so on, uh, is of course the therefore negation of this whole uh, naturalized system, this whole mode of being in which you exchange, in which uh, uh, exchange value uh, rules, in which capital has the power of God. Uh, literally. And in order to understand that power, actually, he makes the point. It's very important to think about it in that way. Therefore, life under capitalism, we could conclude, uh, uh, is a, a conversion of labor to capital. It comes to that. Whether your own labor or other people's labor. If it's your own labor, you are the miserable, you, you are unfree, you will always become more unfree and you will always become more uh, alienated. If it's other people's labor, then you are the capitalist, uh, but be careful, there are other sharks around you. Any moment they could eat you, then, then you will join us, except you don't even have the, the tools to survive or the mind to survive, so something might happen to you uh, in addition to depression. So um, if you actually care about freedom in any sense, including the liberal sense, Marx would say, it is better for you to join the proletarian revolution. It's the only way, it's not freedom itself, but it's the only way of, uh, 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 of working towards that uh, possibility of, uh, of human freedom, of, the, of putting an end to the human alienation. Okay, there are so many other important uh, issues we could go back to. I would just uh, want to draw your attention to uh, to a place where, again, in the second section of the third uh, manuscript, where he talks about the question of, you know, remember, he, he talks about Aristotle. Aristotle was the one who, who actually got to the point, who, who said, uh, you, as, as the individual, you are, you are, is the universe, you are the species, you know, and, and this is this is right in front of us because you are in that very physical sense the product of the parents of that regeneration. And then the, the, the someone who objects would say, where did the parents come from? And Marx says, okay, now you are committing a very stupid fallacy. Uh, why? Because I'm trying to uh, to make a case, uh, deny something. You are already presupposing the existence of that something, and then you ask the question. He says, "My advice for you, then, you know, it's a very uh, in, very Marxist in that very personal uh, skill of critique." Marx has in terms of actual argumentation, valid versus invalid, sound versus unsound. Uh, uh, when he says, when, uh, quote, when you ask about the creation of nature and man, you are abstracting. In so doing, Marx says, from man and nature, you postulate them as non-existent, and yet you want me to prove them to you as existing. You see what's happening here. So there is no, like these are, that's the problem with abstraction. You already, you, you, you create these things in your mind. In, in my existence, nature exists. And in my existence, the society exists. In, in my, it's in, only in my existence as a human being uh, that history can exist. But that history can mean anything. Everything else, when you have, we have problems. We have problems of alienation. We have problems created under class, in class society. And then we confuse them, either for, you know, confuse them metaphysically. Then we go to, to this illusion Feuerbach talked about. 
or otherwise, or there's the state or civil society, or family, all together in one bigger institution under the capitalist modes of production. So let's continue that then. It's such a great passage. Marx says, now I say to you, follow me, give up your abstraction and you will also give up your question. Or if you want to hold on to your abstraction, then be consistent. And if you think of man and nature as non-existent, then think of yourself as non-existent, right? You know, that, that, that is a very logical move there. For you too are, so here, back to the quote, for you too are surely nature and man. So that's what I was trying to explain. Let's continue. Don't think, don't ask me, for as soon as you think and ask, your abstraction from the existence of nature and man has no meaning? Or are you such an egoist that you conceive everything as nothing and yet you want yourself to exist? What a great punch right there at the, the very foundations of uh, that false duality we were talking about. It's not even one false duality, it's multiple false dualities, but that particular one we're talking about is, you know, the individual versus society. As if, you know, there's, there's this independent existence that is the individual and then there's society against each other. And by the way, this is, this again is not just a universal mistake we made. No, it is very uh, unique to Western uh, uh, thought. Of course, Western in, in this case, uh, includes what is now called the Middle East or Near East and so on. So the Abrahamic, so, 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 so to speak, the Abrahamic religions and so on, where you have this division between between these things, you know, there's nature, there's a human, there's the, that other power that kind of hates it all. And then at the end, only at the end, where we can have no access to after everything is over, after the game is over, when we are dead after that, then uh, that reconciliation is and justice is possible. That doesn't make sense uh, in, say, really any other canon. If, if you came to, to North America, or if you went to, and really anywhere in the East. But for example, uh, uh, in the Buddhist philosophy, it doesn't make any sense. These, these dichotomies. That is, that is abstraction. In fact, I, I, I think, I mean, this, let's be careful not to you know, stereotype or anything. Um, but I think, I mean, personally, I, I would like, you know, I, 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 you know uh, as, as an Asian, I, uh, uh, so I'm not talking about, I'm not generalizing or anything, but as an Asian, right? Don't laugh, yes, I'm an Asian, I'm an Asian. This Middle East thing is very new. It's very new, 20th century. So as an Asian, I could just, you know, tell myself, but now I tell you because you know, this is a discussion. Uh, there's something really strange in this mindset that uh, divides the world between these all these, you know, categories, uh, fict completely fictional categories. What is, have you ever posed and asked yourself, what is nature? Like some people have this stupid idea that nature, you know, the romantic, you know, the birds, the trees, the you know, you could always be poetic towards it, towards it. And then some others have whatever, the natural laws, the brutality, the 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 you know, the war of all against all, and so on and so forth. But and and it goes on. And then you have basically anyone you meet has an opinion about the human nature. And for some reason, that picture is always gloomy, terrible. And it seems then uh, we are so deep in this kind of uh, error, basically really logical error, uh, the problem of perception, that we kind of uh, forgot even to question the premises or the abstractions. Uh, but Marx here, uh, I think this is one of the crucial places 
where he uh, he problematizes the drafts. Okay, I don't read this very long. One more thing, I'm going to read this quote because you can't you can't just uh, uh, not it. But since for the socialist man the entire so-called history of the world is nothing but the creation of man through human labor, nothing but the emergence of nature for man, so he has the visible, irrefutable proof of his birth through himself, of his genesis. So you want, don't you want the origin? You know, where did my father, where did my mother come from, where did da 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 where Don't we, you know, the origin, isn't that the, the point? of all this metaphysicalization of everything. But Marx says it is it is this very label, that that very you know first premise that proves to me that we are actually the we are the only origins for us, that that process that that is the creation. And and then he has some great comments also of course on and creation and what's not, and uh, the whole problem with that kind of uh, uh, approach. I would love to a little bit now talk about you know, uh, the Rida on this, but uh, but we'll keep that maybe for the discussion. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and then we will continue. I'll stop the recording. Give me one second. Um, stop. Oops. Yes, stop.